Can you hear everything okay? Um, does it, can you hear it all okay? Yeah. Um, so yes, this is um, what I'm going to talk today about is is somewhat different than than what I initially anticipated. The theme of what I want to talk about is change through time, and I'm going to emphasize that through a multiple through multiple different angles, actually four <coughs> different angles. But but the thread through all of this is. What can we understand by looking at biodiversity through time? So what I'm going to do is look at, at these four different aspects. First, I'm going to talk about the island, an island chrono sequence. I'm going to focus on um, the islands of Hawaii and look at how you can get an idea of, of change through time by looking at those islands specifically. Then I'm going to move into museums, and I'm going to talk about museum specimens for understanding more recent change in, in biodiversity, and then get into integrating diverse kinds of, of specimen data in order to understand the dynamics of, of, of change. And then what I'm going to end up with is, is kind of the, what I see as the pathway to the, to the future, and integrating across um, museums globally and trying to foster interaction with a, with a broader community. Basically, the idea of building a, a system that can be used, used for everyone. And I want to show the fundamental um, reason for wanting to do that. But first of all, we'll start with islands, because that's where, that's, that's kind of my home base, and that's where I've done most of <coughs> my work. I've focus on the islands of the Hawaiian chain, and the reason is that, well, partly, they're, they're wonderful places to work. In fact, um, you know, Mark Twain said um, of Hawaii that it's the loveliest fleet of islands that lies anchored in any ocean, which is, is, is very true, but the thing is that, you know, this is kind of the image that Hawaii conjures up, you know, beaches and, and um, swimming and all of this kind of stuff. But the thing that I want to focus on here is th this particular aspect of islands is, is their isolation. Um, so the, the fact that islands are isolated allows you to get a, a, a real feel for what, what is actually going on. They're basically microcosms, and so you can start to get uh, insights into processes that, that are going on in these, these discrete little little microcosms, often repeated over space. So th it's no surprise, of course, then, that um, many theories in both ecology and evolution were developed on islands. This is the theory of natural selection. Um, Charles Darwin's work, which is based out of the Galapagos, and he was looking at at birds on the different islands of the Galapagos and looking at the size of the beak. We're all very familiar with, with what he found, that, that, that these birds are all very closely related, but each one has a beak specifically adapted to a different diet. And so he could understand just the mechanics of, of how evolution might happen based on comparisons of birds between these different islands. Likewise, Alfred Russell Wallace developed many of his ideas on this in the same vein um, he was working in the Spice Islands of Indonesia. And it, th in, in the same way, he was looking at the, in these discrete systems, trying to understand the evolutionary processes um, that, that were going on and, and made some you know, remarkable observations at the same time as Darwin. So w we can see how, th how valuable these systems are for understanding the evolutionary process. It, these island systems have also been used to understand ecological phenomena. One, one of the best known that I'm not going to go into in, in great detail, but just to highlight one of the most fundamental elements in, um, in ecology and biogeography is the understanding of species area relationships. And MacArthur and Wilson boiled this down to a balance between immigration, the, an idea, again, that they developed on um, on, on islands. So, so the, the, the idea is that the species diversity on an island is the balance between immigration species coming in and extinction species going out, with immigration affected by the pr proximity to a source and extinction affected by island area. And so they, this was a really nice, broadly held um, theory. Again, 
integral to this is the fact that you've got islands or discrete systems in order to, to develop these ideas. Um, so for my work then, I'm focusing on um, the islands of the Hawaiian chain, and I want to just introduce a little bit the, the, the islands of Hawaii. And I should say that in my work in the past, I've focused on um, spiders, and the, the reason for that is I, I know spiders, and you have to have a foundation from where to, to, to jump off, and I, I, I know these spiders <laughs> inside out. And so spiders in, in Hawaii have diversified kind of in the same way that, that the, the Darwin finches have in the Galapagos. They're incredibly diverse, um, all kinds of shapes, sizes, ecological affinities, and all narrowly endemic to tiny little places on, on you know, they're, they're endemic to Hawaii, but they're endemic to a single island of Hawaii, a single volcano within an island, and a single habitat within that volcano, within that island. So they're endemic to these tiny little areas and incredibly diverse. Just to give you a couple of examples here, this one is, is only found on the summit of, of Mount Ka'ala, this one mountain chain on, on Oahu. And it's only on the summit, it's not on the sides. And um, it specializes on amphipods. It's a big spider, still undescribed. Um, so it, just to kind of highlight the, the fact that these, these organisms are, are very um, tightly associated with a given habitat and a specific microhabitat, allowing you to really act at, the, at the mechanics of adaptive diversification. Um, just one more example here. This is one that I was so excited to, to find. This is, on, um, this is one that actually had been described when I first got to Hawaii. Um, it's, it's, got, um, it's got long claws on the ends of its tarsi, and, and it, it, which are the, uh, the legs, which are just, um, maybe I'll use this. Um, and so just uh, l these long claws. And it was described in, in the, you know, in whatever, 1890 something. And, and, and so, so um, the, the Simone, who, who described it, had said, you know, the, the, it's got these long claws. And, and he said, it's found on Kauai. And Kauai is huge, you know. I mean, it's a, it's a small island, but gosh, where in the world do you look? So I looked at the summit. I looked at it. I thought, it's got to be high. I went higher and higher. But Anyway, it turned out it was low. It was, it was at low, the, the kind of lowest you can go and, and still have some native forest. And when I found that, that site where it was, it, these bright green things appeared from nowhere. It's so exciting. And, and they, so the, these are the, the claws on the animals, and um, they impale their, their prey directly from the air. They're really pretty extraordinary animals. But, I mean, there's, there's some others that I won't go into <laughs> to ecstasies about, but, but all of them are, are um, you know, tightly um, associated with a given habitat and allows you to get it, the, the interaction between the, these organisms and the, the habitat that they occupy. Perhaps the, the best known of these is, is probably the Hawaiian happy face spider, so called because. Um, Anyway, so, so, so the, 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 these animals are, are very diverse and, and provide insights into the, the, the ecology of the environments where they, they occur. So what, what, was, what, what can you do with these islands beyond understanding how lineages evolve? And I want to get into a specific aspect of a work that, that we've started fairly recently. And so this is the idea. And the thing is, you can understand the evolutionary history of organisms by looking at, at how things change over time, the temporal trajectory. And so looking along, you know, inferred changes that have happened along branches of a tree. This is what an evolutionary biologist looks at. So the history, you kind of ignore space doesn't really matter, except, you know, what it, wh how it affects what, what you see at the tips of the trees. The focus on these changes and the what happened along these branches. In contrast, in ecology, we're interested in, in the, the details of interactions at a given space, a, at a given point in time. We're looking at how, how organisms interact, who eats whom, and how often, and why. And so it's a m much more nuanced understanding of the ecology of, of the, well, just what's going on at a given point, something you can't possibly get in this kind of um, scenario. 
but you can get really at, at the details of, of, of what's going on in the system by looking at one point in time, the current time, and really understanding that. But you know, what, we, what we'd love to do is, is get some kind of detailed understanding of the ecology over evolutionary time. How do you do that? How do you bring these two together, get a, a detailed understanding of, of the, the ecology of the environment as, as, it, as the whole community evolves? How do you bring those th two things together? And this is where islands come in. Um, so we've been using islands of different age to try and connect these two. The idea is that you can look at organisms, how organisms in their communities change over time. So how do you do that? You need a specific kind of island in order to do that. And this is where Hawaii comes in again because it, it provides that opportunity. It's not just an isolated archipelago. It, well, it is, but, but it's, it's got this other attribute that is incredibly important for understanding um, the, the interaction between ecology and evolution. The thing is that it's a hot spot. So you've got the, the oceanic upwelling down here. There's, there's this big pot of lava down here. And it, it oozes up and forms islands. And it's been doing this for, for ages. And so, so y it, it bubbles up and, and forms, you know, just, just piles of lava come out. We heard about you know, a rapid increase in the outflow of lava earlier this year. But it, it kind of um, gets faster and slower. But the point is that it builds these, these mountains. And so it pops up and forms one mountain after the other. But at the same time, the Pacific plate is moving away from the hotspot as, as, as this is happening. The, the hotspot itself stays in one place. The effect then is that you've got these very young systems, these, these substrates that are just forming on, on the youngest island of Hawaii currently. And then systems that are older and older, and the oldest one is Kauai. <coughs> so what this allows you to do is look at how, what old communities look like versus younger, younger, younger. And just to show you how this works, I'm just going to illustrate one lineage just to show that it actually happens. This is um, just a, ver a very clean story, the work of, of Terry Shaw, who's at, at Cornell. But Terry works on these crickets. And so this is just, a, you, this is a phylogeny, but you don't have to worry about it because I, I, I want to show you how the crickets have progressed down the island chain. They go from the, the oldest island, and this is the ancestor of all of the crickets on this island of Kauai. And then one lineage has hopped down, uh, what, sorry, um, go, go back, it's hopped down to, to Oahu, that, so the next youngest island, and then down to Molokai, Maui, and the big island. So just hop down from the oldest to the younger island. And likewise, the, this other lineage, it started on Kauai, and then hopped down to Oahu, and then Maui, and then the big island. So you get this progression from older to, to younger islands. And just you know, most organisms do this, and so as a result, you can use the islands as, as, as this kind of space for time substitution. So this is what the islands would have looked like five million years ago. Kauai just sitting there, other islands were, were far apart, that, 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 that these um, islands that are currently atolls, they would have been when Kauai formed, they were far apart and low. So you get Kauai formed kind of in the middle of nowhere and then two and a half million years ago, Oahu formed and then about a million years ago, you've got Maui forming then Hawaii forming half a million years, and then, then the present. And so basically you can look at, you know, there you have a five million year old community. Here you have a two and a half million year old community, uh, a kind of one million, and then, then, you know, just something coming up to the present day. So the, the thing here is that you can look at this as an entire sequence of, of um, communities of, of different age. It's not perfect, but, but it really gives you insights as to what, what's going on in these different age communities. So what have we been doing with this system? So what we've been trying to do is looking at um, sites of different age across the archipelago. So looking at how communities have changed going from the youngest sites to the oldest sites. 
So, so this just shows the sites that we sampled in. And here you've got, we've also looked at elevation gradients as, as at the same time. And what we do then is go to these multiple sites oh. and then, okay, ready? Um, no, then I thought there was a yeah, so 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 just keep it away from that fern. So pull on your end a little bit first. So There's lots of happy face too, huh? <laughs> Brendan, who is, was here climbing, um, he, he's going and clipping the branches up at the, at the tops of the trees. So the thing then is that you, you do this and you get a lot of arthropods. And this is why, this is wh where it becomes a big data science problem. That this is the data. And you think, oh, yikes, you know, what do you do with that? And so um, being a good evolutionary biologist, ecologist, um, trained in, in understanding what every single organism is. Um, you know, we were separating everything out into, you know, identifying it. And um, this wonderful postdoc, Henrik Krenwinkel, who's just got a position at Trier University in Germany, um, Henrik came and said, you know, this is going <laughs> to take you a long time. And he became very interested in the project. And he, he said, you know, it's, it's going to take you 40 years <laughs> at the rate you're going. And that was optimistic. And so um, what, what, what he did then was, was he convinced us that a better approach would be to use metabarcoding. Um, so metabarcoding is this um, a rapid method of biodiversity assessment that basically combines two technologies. It's DNA-based identification, high throughput D DNA sequencing. Basically, what you're looking for is what are all the entities there? You're not worried about the evolutionary history or anything. You're simply looking. You want to see what all the entities are. And you want to know the abundance of all those entities in a given community. So just to give you a quick idea of the data and to make you understand, kind of, to, just to help you understand kind of what the, what, what the data is like, just the, the point here is that there are a lot of sites, about 80 sites. We sample different plants at each site. We've got um, multiple samples per, um, in, for d different collecting methods. We then sort the samples to size. Um, which is part of the protocol in, in, um, to, to, to get it abundance data. Um, so you, you sort them to size, and then you do two applicants per size class. And just to, I mean, again, this is just to give you an idea of, of the extent of the data. And you, you end up with just gazillions of, of, um, of, these, sh of these sequences. Um, and so they're just, they're indicative of, of just terminals. They're, they're just telling you what entities are in that sample. And you get a lot of them, as, as you can see. That, and that's all, I, I'm not going to go into any detail here. But there's a lot of data that comes out of this. Um, so what do you do? I mean, it's just lots of, of, of sequence data. So what do you do with it? First of all, I want to emphasize that the, you, these, are, are, these are bits of DNA that are used to tell you what an entity is. However, to make sense of it, you have to have it anchored on, on what a specimen is. So you need to know what, what you, you need to have what's called a reference collection. So you need to have identification of the taxa in that, in that community, all the species in that community. We, and this will tell you, once we've got it anchored as to what the specimens are, what entity they are, we can get it information like relative abundance and interactions. So what this allows then is, is getting at, the, it allows us to barcode or reference a complete as assemblage of identified taxa. Once we have the reference collection, so that all of these OTUs are linked to something we know out there. So what do we end up with? We end up with information, a lot of information on all individuals. That, so abundance, the identity of all individuals throughout all of these communities of different age and across different elevation gradients. With that, armed with, with all of that data, 
we can start to get an understanding of entire, the evol well, just how communities change over this, this, this space and over time, using the space for time substitution that Hawaii has to offer. And so this is what I'm, I'm going to just mention, some of the things that, that we can get at, that we hope to end up being um, predictive in terms of understanding the communities. So we get at the identity and abundance, the networks and interactions, and the, the hopefully the, the tipping points or, or, or transitions in, in the community when, when they get invaded. And so just thinking about the identity and abundance of all members, what information does, does that provide us? And this is where we've been working with John Hart and um, to understand what we might expect in terms of species abundance distributions. Why is this important? Because most, most communities fit a species abundance distribution. And so when something is out of, it doesn't fit it, then you know that, that there's something going on in that community. So this is the idea be behind um, what, what John wrote, the, the maximum entropy theory of ecology. And the idea is basically, it's a statistical approach. I shouldn't be saying that with John in the audience, but it's a statistical approach. Um, but, but it's basically packaging energy most parsimoniously through individuals to species. It's basically just um, telling us what we might predict in terms of um, species abundance at a, at, a given, at a given site. So I, again, I'm not uh, going to go into this at all, except to say that we've tested this, this um, idea just to see whether you, wh what happens when we look at the data and, and see whether it fits the expectations of this theory. So, so what we have here is the line indicates what you might expect in the white lines are in terms of the species abundance data, in terms of the predictions from John's, uh, John's theory. And so then the data are the circles from the oldest island is, is there, the youngest site is right here. And you can see that as you go to the youngest site, here you get a strong deviation from the predictions of Maxent. And so the important thing here is that it's clear that there's something going on here, which is not entirely surprising because it's a very young site and it's just getting started. And so, so you would expect to find a deviation from the, the, from the predictions of the maximum entropy theory. And so we, the idea is then to use the same kind of approach to look at invasions and, and other aspects that, that might be affecting these systems. And this is also a work in, in progress. So other things that, that you can look at here, of course, to, to try and get a feel for how communities are responding to, to change, we can look at networks. And I'll just kind of go through this very superficially. But the idea here is to get a feel for what, what does a network look like when it's just starting out, and how does it change? So, so basically, the idea is to look at um, how communities Basically, you know, when they're just starting out versus getting older and older, you might expect that they they become more more intricate and and interconnected. And so the idea, which which we're th which is still a, a very much a work in progress, is to understand how these 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 um, communities change in terms of the interactions between um, individuals in that community. In the same context, what we want to get at is invasions and tipping points. We want to understand what happens when <coughs> a community is impacted. How is it going to change in, in, in the world that we're, we're moving into? And this is particularly poignant when you get to Hawaii. Hawaii is the most isolated archipelago in the world. What's happened over, over the last um, few years? Basically, you've first of all got um, the arrival of Polynesians. And with the Polynesians came lots of, um, that there were uh, huge populations built up on, on these islands. And so with, with that, um, a lot of habitat modification. And this is where a lot of the, the, the isolation started to be lost there. Then a huge number of invasive species came then. And of course, more recently, there's many, many, many more um, arrivals. And so, what, what is going on here? The tricky thing now is to just see whether we can 
get some insights as to what's going on in the face of, of, of all of the invasions that are affecting these islands. Um, so as you move towards the present, is there some point at which we're going to see a flip and, and the community is going to go beyond, you know, to the point of no return? We know when we arrive in Honolulu, that's a point of, well, uh, well a, a, a point of ecological no return. <laughs> the, the communities in, in, at lower elevations on, on these sites are, are, are gone. There's nothing native there. Um, and so the, the critical thing that we can actually test in these islands is to see whether, whether we can identify tipping points, whether we can mitigate the, those kinds of effects, and can we do that soon enough to make a difference. Just to kind of illustrate this, this huge issue, Invasive species are just, there's all sorts of things going on. Pigs, goats, frogs, ants, all of these um, melastomes. These are all invasive species in Hawaiian that are causing huge issues. This is me a few years ago just pulling up ginger, which is a horrible invasive plant. Um, and the thing is when, when species get to islands, they tend to reach very large numbers. Um, this is um, a, a, a video my husband took um, getting off the boat in Tahiti. And here, you, this woman is uh, looking up at the sky and thinking, you know, there's not a cloud in the sky. Why is it raining? Um, and, and it's actually this bug. Um, so the bug has reached such huge numbers that it's just, um, it's called the pissing bug, that it pees on the sap of the plants and, and, um, and, and so p pisses out the, the, the excess water. And so you've got, um, basically the point is that they, you get these huge abundances of things when they invade. This is just one more example of um, of ginger here on the on the left. This is the Nature Conservancy's property on Maui, and the ginger is just a positive army that's just pushing at the at the fence line, and and it's just the efforts of the Nature Conservancy people that are keeping the ginger out. But of course, that can't last. I mean, uh, you go to the gulch and you find that it's just run up the gulch. I mean, it's just just very moving when you see these these kinds of things, and you start to think. You know, how, what, what can we possibly do in the face of this kind of um, impact? So, so you think, at this point, you think, well, why worry about networks? Um, so, so I just want to say one, one thing here that makes you think, well, there must be something to understand. This is work that um, Art Medeiros, who is a, who is a colleague in Hawaii, and he works on Maui, and he, he has been working on the south slope of Maui, just, just um, this little patch here, and what he did was, he, he recognized, he came in and saw this, which is basically the, the, the Oahi, the, the hillside of Oahi, and, and um, the, the, it looks like just any ordinary pasture, except that um, those dead kind of stick things are kind of the last, you know, individual of this and that. It's, it's, it used to be a very rich forest. So, so he said, you know, there's life there. There's got to be something that can be done. So what he did was he fenced off areas and, and he physically um, got, got a fast-growing native plant, Doronea, and um, got people to, to, well, he grew them up and uh, got the community involved. They, there's very strong cultural component of this. And so they go up there every single week, they go up to, to this site and um, they, they physically plant. And so what has happened? You know, the forest has, has come back. It's, it's just, this is the, the forest that has come back. This is the pasture land. So there's, got, there's something to understand here, and I just want to mention that um, we're working together and, and with, um, we've got preliminary bids funding to do this, but um, <coughs> the, the, um, Carl Bodiger is, is very much involved in trying to understand what sh whether we can figure out network structure here and wh identify tipping points and how we might mitigate, mitigate against these. Um, Part of this is also um, Stefan van der Walt is working with Natalie Graham to help identify and speed up the, the process in, in doing this. And one other thing to, to mention here is that we've actually expanded the effort into the Pacific, even though we don't have any um, results yet, but, but um, people want this information. We've got to understand how these communities are changing. So we're working with Evan Economo at the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology and Haldry Rogers at, at Guam. Haldry's holding an invasive snake that is um, that has really decimated the bird fauna in Guam. 
Okay, so that's what I want to do now in, in just um, this, this, this second part here is really just drill in a bit a, as to what, what, the speci what, what other ways that we can I understand um, how organisms change through time. And I, there's, so, so we're going to look at museum specimens here because they carry history. It's not the deep history that you see in Hawaii, it's a, it's a more recent history, but it's a very important history. And this is work that um, Craig Moritz spearheaded. Um, it's called the, the Grinnell Resurvey Project. Grinnell was, was the director of the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, and he did uh, this amazing survey of Yosemite um, back at the turn of the, uh, the 1900 or so. And so what, what he, you know, he surveyed these, these um, chipmunks and a lot of other things, but, but he, he got these, these animals and preserved them beautifully with all the notes associated. And so there were record there. And so what that has allowed is, is a, a resurvey to see whether, whether anything has changed. And so, so Craig and, and a team of others from the MBZ a few years back went and, and resurveyed these areas and got chipmunks that were um, stable. Um, this one here, um, this, this one species of chipmunk, and then a couple of populations of this um, Tamias, Tamias alpinus, which was retracting its range. They could get genomic data from these specimens, and what they were able to show based on genomic data is that you get strong covariance indicating that most sites haven't changed. This is um, historic data from, from the allele frequency from historic data on the, on the, the, from the genomic data, and this is the modern. And so you get strong covariance, but the sites showing these differences, these outliers, are indicative of selection. So this is just understanding how things are responding to change through that time. Another study that I'll just mention, just to kind of illustrate the kinds of things you can do with, with museums, this is at work that um, Todd Dawson and Neil Sasui did on bees. And you think, well, what can bees tell you? Well, one of the really interesting things is that bees carry pollen with them. And so they can, the pollen is a signature of the environment. And so what they were able to do was look at how the, the, the use, uh, use um, isotopes of carbon and nitrogen and see the signatures. This is Berkeley in the 1980s. This is Berkeley, um, Berkeley more, so, so sorry, this is, this is the change. This is the more recent one. This is the oldest one. The point here is that um, you get a change in the signature of the carbon nitrogen ratios indicating that the environment that, that of, of where the pollen was collected has changed over this time. So they, they reconstructed the historical interactions by identifying the pollen on, the, on these bees um, and, and just tracking the impacts of ecological climate change um, using this, this stable isotope data. Okay, so, so what, what we've shown here is then that museum specimens can be used for understanding more recent change. What I want to do now is just quickly tell you about one effort that we've been involved in, and, and John Deck and Michelle Koo and Joyce Gross were particularly involved in this effort, that to look at what specimens can actually tell you when you integrate across different data types um, and over the history. So we use specimens from the different museums, the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology, the Essex Museum of Entomology, and the UC Jepson Herbarium, and the UC Museum of Paleontology, using the historical framework provided there to just ask you know, wh whether you can intersect the collections with providing the historic data that can define you know, what, was, what was the environment like then, how have they responded integrate that with climate models to understand past climate and how the, change is, uh, uh, how the changes in the organisms are uh, linked to changes in the environment. And the idea then is to get this information out to government agencies so that you can provide a history of how change has happened in, in different organisms. So just super briefly, the idea here is that w what we're doing is getting data from all of these different kinds of, of sources, in particular, th these kinds of sources associated with a given specimen, the photos of a specimen, the specimens themselves, the field notes, 
and they're fed into the, the museum databases. Here we develop climate models and other sensor databases in, in particular. And what, um, what this allows us to do, we, we're getting information from, from all of these different sources, the vegetation maps, the, from the, fields, the Berkeley field stations, all of the, the data from, from these, these um, sources that reflect a deep you know, history of collection from, for, uh, from over 100 years. And so what um, Joyce, Michelle, and John did, uh, did together was with, with others in the team was um, put this data together and, and um, link it through an, uh, the, the, with a, an API constellation, GP, GBIF, which is the Global Biodiversity Informatics um, for, um, what does the F stand for? But, but it's, it's a basically a repository for all um, specimen data that based in Denmark. IDIG Bio is a digitization effort, national digitization effort that's based in Florida, and I'll talk a little bit more about these. EcoEngine is a home-built engine that, that links these data types specifically in Berkeley. GenBank is, is, a, is a, um, a, a repository of genetic data. These are all specimen-associated bits of information. And what you can do then is um, link these to th these kinds of information to Th this kind of information to, to geographic information. So you, you connect this to, to information on temperature, um, land cover, topography, hydrology. You can link all of these together and then start to, to understand things of, about the environment, about how it's changing. So you link these together into that the, the, the we, we developed, or, or John, Michelle, and, and Joyce and others developed this, this um, portal, this Holos portal, or now um, reserve mapper. And this, this allows you to actually see how this information plays out over time. And then the, the next step is to analyze these data in the, in the context of, of statistical packages and, and apps. But the, the, the thing here is, you know, this, is a, a, the, the, this puts all the data together. What, what I want to do in the last little bit is go beyond, I mean, we've talked about integration of diverse data Across, across time and, and how you can get it change um, using these museum collections. The last bit I want to talk about here is, is a recent effort we've, we've started um, that, that involves people both nationally and internationally to look at what this information can actually do for you. Um, so this is um, work that I've been doing with, with people across the world. Um, that um, Volker Mossberger, who's based in, in Frankfurt, was, was, uh, was a major player in this. Donald Hoburn, who's, who's leader of GBIF um, in Denmark. Um, Jim Hankin is at Harvard. Ari Page with IDIG Bio. And the late um, John LaSalle, who's the Atlas of Living Australia. Um, so what we did was we, we got people together in, um, in Frankfurt and identified what the issues were. And so w there are a lot of a lot of efforts across the world that are, that are recognizing the power of museum data. You know, it's got this history that, that is, is really so important for understanding and, and projecting into the future. And so, so given that we know this, what do we do with it? How do we insert this data into the general understanding of, of people? How can we improve access here? And, and how, can we, how can we show the, the, the power, the potential of this approach? So just to kind of illustrate what's, what's happening here is that we're recognizing that this, all of this taxonomic data associated with, with um, GBIF, that all of these repositories of specimen data and, and genetic data and, and the Encyclopedia of Life, which, which houses information on specimens, detailed information. We've got all of this data. We're starting to put it together. The, the, it's, you know, the, the importance of standards is coming to the fore. The importance of con coordination is coming to the fore. And so, so there's a, gr a, a recognition of this, this need. Um, and there's also a recognition of the huge amount of online environmental data that's now available and how these can be linked. And many efforts have now spa been spawned from this, focusing on interpretation and visualization tools. 
the thing is, how then do you get it in, into society? How do you get it where people in business are going to use it, people in health are going to use it? This is the tricky thing. So biodiversity in business, health, design, art, how do you get it in there? And this is the real problem that we recognize. The delivery of data in raw and standardized form is, is really needed so that because that, that's what we need to, to really serve the function that the stakeholders are interested in. And this is actually where Sierra, who's, who just in, did the introduction here, Sierra has been very interested in this from the data science perspective and is exploring this kind of thing, just what, what these data are and how a data, science is, data scientist is actually, how, they can, how a data scientist can access this data and use that data without all the filtering between you know, what, 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 you know, what people like me like to see and, and um, you know, just making it so that it goes into the mainstream of data science. So the big thing here is really defining stakeholders. And this is what I kind of want to end on, is just watch, watch that we have to define the stakeholders. There's this amazing resource there, and w we, we have the potential to, to, to make, make use of it. Then people really need it, though they perhaps don't understand it yet. Um, but, but so far, what we've tended to do is have this philosophy of you build it and they'll come. But we know that that's not true, that we've, we, you know, many of these things have been built and, and the people don't come. So the, what we have to do is figure out a way to, to not only build it, but also insert it into where, where it has to be. You have to do marketing and um, really do a good job at showing the importance of, of, of these kinds of approaches. What you've been doing then is, um, so, so looking at um, what we're doing is, is trying to get this kind of data into the domain of, of major play players that, that really could use this, this information. And so I want to just highlight that a few areas where I think that this kind of data is, is integral. And with, without it, we're, we're, we're doing society a major, di major disadvantage. We're putting everyone at a disadvantage by not providing this data in the form that it's needed. So these, the, th the things I'm going to just highlight in the last few minutes here are urban planning, health, agriculture, and disaster miti mitigation. So for urban planning, why would an urban planner want this kind of data? So the, the thing here is, and, and this is actually the work of Peter Colthorpe, who's a, an architect in, in Berkeley, and I've been really impressed by the kinds of things that he does. And so he's really interested in building, um, building urban environments that, um, that are nice to live in and, and have minimal, um, minimal impact on, on um, you know, the, the, for, for climate and, and various other things. So what he's, he's developed is this um, resource that, that takes into account lots of different data, point, data types. And so it's called, um, this, the, it's, well, it's an urban planning um, tool that, um, that, that puts together lots of different data, including environmental data. The thing that's missing from this is the specimen data. Now, you say, well, you know, it's got all the environmental data, but, but actually, you know, the environmental data, as we talked about right at the beginning, it's ecological, it's now, it's, you know, time is like, you know, since the six, 60s. Um, so it's not, it's not anchored. You need, you need deep foundations. So, so basically, when you don't take into account deep history and just how things change, how, how communities react to change, you basically, you're building a structure, you're building your understanding on, on very flimsy footing. You take out one of those blocks and the whole thing's gonna collapse. A species will go extinct and then all of your outcomes of, your, of, your, of the models that you project are, are going to be, are gonna change. 
So we've got to have this understanding. Likewise for disease outbreaks. I mean, many, I'll, I'll just, uh, just a, a few examples. The influenza, the Spanish influenza outbreak, a huge problem. The collections have been really important in the reconstruction of the history of the virus and how it's changed. We need this information to see what's going to happen in the future. Um, hantavirus. Here, pe what, what people use, is they use specimens of rodents to show when the virus appeared, how it spread amongst the populations, and hence predicted uh, new outbreaks in the human population. And, and then um, guinea worm. These are just examples where they actually use museum specimens, and, and mostly uh, they, they don't, but, but just showing you what, what it can do. Um, guinea worm, it measures, um, they took measures to protect the human population. Um, once, the, once it was realized that its, it's different growth <coughs> stages and, and in, in the different host species were sampled, preserved, documented, and analyzed, but they had to do those collections. So just, just two other examples I'm going to give you here. There's um, this growth of this area, the next generation agriculture, and I'm not going to go into this at all except to highlight the fact that you've got in, in this next generation agriculture, which is basically looking at how to, to, how to, to, to lay out a farm. What are the problems going to be? What should I invest in? How should I arrange the, the crops? How should I treat the crops? Which crops? To, to get at that, you see all of the red highlights where museum data can tell you exactly how organisms are going to react to a given setting. Without that information, again, you're, you're building a house on very flimsy pudding. And to finish, uh, one very near and dear to our heart, fire. Um, so fire, you think, oh, well, you know, it's dry, and um, it's, it's dry and windy. That's why you get fires. But there's so much else going on. These are just kind of illustrating all of the different things that, that are changing in and, and accentuating the issue of fire. Many, most of these issues relate to organisms, and so we really need to understand the, the organisms and the history of those organisms to understand how fire mitigation can be best affected and what we might expect as we move into the future. We've got to understand those dynamics, and we've got to understand the history of those dynamics. Again, without this, we're building a very flimsy foundation that, that is, is likely to, to topple because we really don't have a firm footing in history. So with that then, I just, um, I've given you a, a kind of an outline, I hope, as to the importance of understanding history in inferring um, the, the how organisms are going to change as we move into the future. I talked about the islands in the context of the, the chrono sequence, the long-term change, the museum specimens for understanding how, how, is the, how communities have changed recently, integrating diverse data sets to understand the dynamics of change, and finally building this up to really get the message out to stakeholders so that we can make a difference in the world. And with that, I just want to thank a couple of people here, the people in my lab in particular. You heard about Andy Rominger, who's now at Santa Fe Institute, Natalie Graham, who's in the audience back there and, and is working with Stefan, and Henrik Krahenwinkel, who's now at Trier. And all of the people I mentioned already who, who were involved in the international effort <coughs> focusing in, at, in Frankfurt. And the, 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 the c budding collaborators, Carl Bodiger, Al Ali Barner, and Jorit Poland, who are, who are working on the networking stuff. And um, Sierra, who um, we've started working with on this project. And the final um, the three that I'll just mention here are um, John Deck, Michelle Koo, and Joyce Gross, who've really um, been instrumental in getting um, all of our data mobilized and um, who would um, really, uh, I think, would, would um, work well in the, this community, the, the data science community here. And yes, if, I, if there are any questions, if there's time for questions, I'd be delighted to, to answer.